And so with that, why don't we grab this thing, the Bible. Let's open it up to Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21. Now we're going to be spending our time this morning looking at the first 14 verses of this chapter. So let's just dig in and start right there. Acts chapter four, uh, 21, verse 1. It says, Now it came to pass that when we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to coast, and then the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patara. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. And when we sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left and sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there the ship was to, to unload her cargo. And finding the disciples, we stayed there for seven days, and they told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. When we come to the end of those days, we departed and went our way, and they accompanied us with their wives and their children and, and, until we were out of the city. And we all knelt down at the shore and we prayed. And when we had taken our leave from one another, we boarded the ship, and they returned home. And when we finished our voyage from Tyre, we then came to Ptolemus and greeted the brethren, and then stayed with them for one day. And then on the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who, who, who prophesied. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down to Judea, and when he had come down to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his hands and his feet. And he said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews... Uh, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> I should have turned off my mic, but I, I didn't see it coming. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when, he, when we had heard these things, both we and those who were from that place pleaded with him not to go to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, and he said, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm ready not only to be bound, but to, to also die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And so when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, the will of the Lord be done. And, and, and Father, that, that is our, our prayer this morning. We pray that ultimately your will would be done. Lord, as we, as we open up this book, Lord, we haven't come to, to, to hear thoughts uh, of, of, of a man. We haven't come to hear deep thoughts or, 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 or anything. Lord, we've come to hear your word because we want to know your will. And so we pray that you would have your, your way with us, your will with us. Lord, our prayer today is, is not that, that my will would be done, that our will be done, but, but Lord, that thy will would be done. That you would have your way with your people as you used your word to speak to us. In Jesus' name, and we all say it. Now, uh, the, the title of today's message, as we, as we jump here in, into Acts chapter 21, we've titled today's message, Stranger Things. <laughs> Stranger Things. No, this is, this is not a sermon uh, about some, some sci-fi on Netflix, uh, you know, uh, about a mysterious girl named Eleven who, who with her psychic kinetic abilities, is, is somehow able to, to see into this alternate universe called the Upside Down. That is not what we're preaching on this morning. But, but rather, here in this passage, we this morning meet a prophet by the name of Agabus. By the name of Agabus. Now, now by the way, uh, let me just say that, that in the Bible, whenever we, we, we meet these prophets and we, and we come, around, uh, come along these, these prophetic characters, can I just say that these prophetic types are often a little different, a, a little weird, a little strange. Hence the name Stranger Things. You know, for example, uh, you take the prophet Jeremiah. You know, in Jeremiah chapter 13, we're told that Jeremiah took his underwear, put them under a rock in the Euphrates River, and then later he digs the underwear up, puts the, the wet underwear on, and he's walking around in his wet underwear, shouting at the people, saying, you people are like these underwear. No wonder he was called the weeping prophet. I mean, if you had to walk around in your wet underwear, you'd weep too. And then there was then there's the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 20, where we're told that, that the prophet Isaiah walked around naked, stark naked, for three years to, to illustrate what was going to happen to Egypt and to Ethiopia. When, when, when the empire of Assyria came in, that the Assyrians were going to come in, they were going to conquer them, and then drag them out naked and make them slaves. So he walked around in his underwear, I'm sorry, he walked around naked for three years years. So I guess if, if Jeremiah was the weeping prophet, Isaiah was the streaking prophet. 
that these prophetic types can be a little different. And so whenever we're dealing with, with, with the things of the prophetic, sometimes it feels like, like you might have just guest starred uh, in season two of Stranger Things. But now as we pick it back up in verse one, uh, in, in fact, look at verses one through six, we, we, we see that Paul now has wandered into prophetic things. Prophetic things. Again, it says in verse one. Now it came to pass, when we had departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to coast, and then the following day to Rhodes, and then from there to Patara. And finding a ship and sailing over to Phoenicia, we went and boarded and set sail. And when we sighted uh, Cyprus, we passed it on the left and, and sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre, for the ship there was, was to unload her cargo. And finding the disciples, we, we, we stayed there for seven days, and they told Paul, through the Spirit, not to go up to Jerusalem. And when we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went our way, and they accompanied us with their wives and children until we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed. And when we had taken our leave from one another, we boarded the ship, and they returned home. Now, by the way, let me ask you this. As a Christian, have you ever had somebody come up to you and say something like, you know what, brother, I've got a word for you. Yeah, I've, got, I've got a word for, from the Lord. Look, listen, the Lord's put something on my heart. I feel like I'm supposed to share something. I've got a word for you. I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but I've, I've had people over the years come up and, and, and do that with me. In fact, quite frankly, uh, in the 33 years that I've been a Christian, uh, there have been a couple of occasions where I believe I may have had a word for someone else. But I'll never forget was, was when I was once a youth pastor. That was a while ago. I've been, I've been pastoring this church for, for 20 years. Uh, and so maybe, uh, see, I was a youth pastor maybe 23, 26 years ago. So I remember when I was a youth pastor and, and leading the high school youth group, in our high school youth group, there was this young man, this, this teenager, who, who, who told everybody that he was a prophet, that he had the gift of prophecy. That's what he would tell people. And so he was always coming up to people and saying, you know what, I got a word for you. I, I, got, a, I got a word for you. The, the, the Lord tell, told me to tell you this and to tell you that. And so on one occasion, he comes up to this, this teenage girl in the youth group, this, this attractive teenage girl in the youth group, and he says, I have a word from the Lord for you. And she's like, well, what is it? And he says, this is the word. The, the, what the Lord is saying is that one day you're supposed to marry me. Worst pickup line ever, by the way. <laughs> but he, he did. He said, you know, the Lord says you're, you're supposed to marry me, and then if you don't listen to that, then, then you are disobeying God himself. Well, she fell for it, and, and they ended up dating, and, and yet throughout their relationship, he was, he was very controlling and very, very heavy-handed and very manipulative. Now, later on, when, when I found out about it and found out that he, he started this whole thing by saying he had a word for her, I kind of pulled him aside, put my hand firmly on his shoulder, said something like, you know, I think I have a word for you. He's like, what is it? I said, get lost, creep. Uh, you know. And so here, uh, in, in Acts chapter 21, the, 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 the church there, the congregation there, they seem to think that they have a word for the Apostle Paul. And so it says in, in verse 4 that, that, that they told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. Now, by the way, when you read verse, uh, verse 4 there, in the original language of the Bible, in, in, in the Greek, you need to know that this was not a command. In other words, it was not in the imperative. It was not a command, but more, it was really more of a, of a suggestion. A suggestion. You see, that, that phrase when it says, through the Spirit. When it says that, that through the Spirit they told Paul not to go up to Jerusalem, that phrase could, could better be translated through impressions. Through an impression. In other words, you know, they, 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 they didn't hear God audibly, out loud, speak and, and, and forcibly command and forbid the Apostle Paul to go to Jerusalem. It was not a command, but rather there was, there was just kind of this sense, just, just kind of this, this inclination, just this, this general impression they were getting that maybe this is what the Lord was saying. That the Lord was saying that, that if you go to Jerusalem, something bad was going to happen. And so in their mind, that meant that God was saying, no, God was saying, don't go. But you see, here's what they did not know. What they did not know was that long before God was talking to them, long before God was, was, was speaking to, to that congregation, long before that, the Holy Spirit started talking to Paul. The Holy Spirit was talking to Paul, and, 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 and the Holy Spirit had been telling Paul that, that when he gets to Jerusalem, bad things were waiting for him. 
bad things were going to happen. And so you see, the point was, they were not telling Paul something new. They were telling him something he already knew. Let me say that again. They weren't telling him anything new. They were telling him something he already knew. You see, oftentimes, that's what prophecy is. It's, it's just confirmation. It's just confirmation uh, of something that the Lord's already been speaking to you about. Something that the Lord's already been dealing with you about and, and, and leading you. It's, it's just some form of, of confirmation. And so, yeah, the, 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 the Holy Spirit was telling the, the church that bad things were waiting for Paul in Jerusalem, but Paul had been hearing the same thing himself. Do you remember, do you remember what we saw last week? Uh, last time in, in Acts chapter 20, verses 22 and 23, Paul says, And see now, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. And so Paul already knew. And by the way, this just reminds us that, that if it really is the Lord who's speaking, then you know what? He's going to speak to both sides. He's not just going to speak to one side. If it's really the Lord, he's going to speak to both sides. Even as, as, as the Lord was on the one hand speaking to the congregation there in the city of Tyre, but on the other hand, he was also speaking to Paul. He's going to speak to both sides. It's kind of like that teenage girl that I mentioned. Listen. If it really was God's will for, for her to marry that schmuck, I mean guy, young man, then you know what? The Lord would have been speaking to her as well. God would have been speaking to her as well. It's not going to be one-sided. And so in this case, the Lord had been already speaking to Paul, and now the disciples, the, the, the Christians entire, they come up and they're like, Paul, you know what? We, we, we get this impression that, that, that the Holy Spirit is saying that, that, that something bad is waiting for you in Jerusalem. That if you go to Jerusalem, bad things are going to happen. But then they interpret it. No, I can so if, if you want our opinion, if you want our interpretation of that, we think that means that God is saying no. That God is saying, don't go. Now listen, the first part, the prophecy itself, that, that was true. Because, because, you know, they're like, you know what, bad things are waiting for you. And, 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 and Paul's like, dude, that's in the Greek. He's like, dude, I, you know, I, I received it. That is right on because the Holy Spirit's been telling me bad things are waiting for me. But then they're like, yeah, so you know what that means? That means God doesn't want you to go. God is closing that door. He doesn't want you to go because bad things are waiting for you. And it's at that point that Paul's like, you know what? I don't receive that. That's, that's, that's not from the Holy Spirit because, because the Holy Spirit's been speaking to me and telling me to go to Jerusalem. I, I've been bound in spirit to go to Jerusalem. And he's been telling me that chains and afflictions await me. Chains and tribulations. And so you see, the, the word was true. The prophecy was true. The interpretation of it was a little off. So now, as we continue in verses 7 through 9, as they, as they continue on their journey, their trip, now they, 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 they meet an evangelist who has four daughters who prophesied. Four daughters who, who, who were prophets. Actually, because they were ladies, I guess they were prophetesses, but that's really hard to say. So... Verse 7. And when they finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Ptolemus and greeted the brethren and stayed there for one day. And then on the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. Now let me just ask you this. How many, in fact, show of hands, how many of you have ever had a fallout with someone else? Come on, get them up. Really, like 30% of you have never had a problem with anybody? You're just angels and maybe you've been surrounded by nothing but angels? That's not true. I mean, you're, I'm staying in front of you and I'm a fallen angel. I mean, I just, I know you've had issues. Okay, Brett, let's try it one more time. How many of you have ever had problems or a fallout with, with someone else? It's a little better. Okay. The rest of you don't speak English and that's fine. Um, you have no idea what I'm saying. So, you know, but, but it's true, right? I mean, I mean, it happens. I mean, sometimes we're, we're in a relationship with somebody. Maybe maybe it's a friendship with someone. Maybe it's, maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a romantic relationship. But there are times where we're in these relationships and then something happens. But the relationship goes south. The, the relationship goes sour and, 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 and it doesn't end well. And so we go our separate ways. But then all of a sudden, it, it's, like, it's like no matter how hard you try, you, for the life of you, cannot avoid this person no matter what. 
I mean, it's like you run into them now more than you did when you were in a relationship with them. I mean, you go to Walmart, there they are. You go to Santiago's, there they are. <laughs> and every time you, you, you bump into and it's always awkward, right? I mean, you bump into them, they bump into you, and you're both like, hey, you? And in the back of your mind, you're like, jerk? <laughs> well, I believe that, 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 that Philip is having one of those moments right now. <clears throat> because think about it, the, the last time Philip saw Paul was, was before Paul was even a Christian, right? I mean, the last time Philip saw Paul, Paul was still a terrorist. In fact, if you think about it, uh, you know, the last time that, that Philip saw Paul, Paul had just murdered Philip's friend, Stephen. If you go back and look at Acts chapter 6, chapter 7, and chapter 8, we, we, we read how, how in the beginning Stephen and, and, and Philip, they were friends, and, and they started off in the ministry together. They started out at the same time in the ministry, but then one day, Stephen, he's, he's out preaching the gospel. He's preaching up a storm, and then all of a sudden, there's this, there's this group of, of overzealous Jews, led, by the way, by Paul, who get offended, and they don't like what they're hearing Stephen preach. So what do they do? They pick up rocks. They pick up stones. Each of these stones weighing somewhere between 10 to 50 pounds. And they pummel him with stone after stone after stone until he's dead. And that whole thing was supervised by Paul. And now, 20 years later, 20 years later, all of a sudden, there's a knock at the door. Paul opens his door. And standing in front of him is the man who murdered his friend. And Paul's all like, hey, brother, I just want you to know, I, I accepted Jesus. I, I became a Christian. In fact, I, I've been out preaching the gospel. And, you know, wouldn't surprise us if in that moment, like, we, we wouldn't have blamed Philip for, for one minute if, if the very next line would have said something like that in that moment, he slammed the door right in Paul's face. So he, he, that he's all like, yeah, right, you're a Christian. You, you used to kill Christians. You know, get lost. You know, don't let the doorknob hit you or the good Lord split you. Take a hike. But that's not what it says. No, what it says is, 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 that, is that Philip accepted them and welcomed them, and they stayed there for days. But you know, this, uh, let, let me ask you, what would you do? I mean, if this was you, how, how would you handle this? I mean, listen, if, if there's someone who, who victimized you, there's someone who, 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 who maybe brutally hurt someone you love and, and care for, and now 20 years later, they show up at your doorstep, and they're all like, hey, man, I just want you to know, I became a Christian. I love Jesus. What are you going to do? Are you going to accept them? Are, are you going to bring them in? Well, Philip did. In fact, this kind of reminds me of, of the story of Raul Reese. Now, some of you know that Raul Reese, he pastors uh, a Calvary Chapel in Golden Springs, uh, California, the Diamond Bar area. And, and, and yet, Raul, I mean, listen, his story was that this was a man who was filled with rage and filled with anger to the point that he was beating his wife and his, his two sons daily. It got to the point that his wife decided she was going to leave him. So Raul Reese, he's, he's out of town at a, at a martial arts conference, and so she decides that she's going to leave her husband. But she thinks, you know what, I, I, I don't want my kids to freak out, so I'm just going to act like everything's normal. So it's a Sunday, we're going to go to church, but after church we're going to leave. So before church, she, she packed her bags, she packed all the suitcases, she put them by the front door, so that that way when church was over, they could come home, grab the bags, throw them in the car, and, 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 and go. Well, the conference ends early. Raul Reese comes home early. She's still at church. He comes home and he finds her suitcases, her bags, right there by the door. And he realizes she's leaving him. And at that point, he snaps. He pulls out all of his guns. A former Marine pulls out all of his guns and he loads them. And he's determined that when she gets home, he's going he's gonna to shoot and murder his wife and his two sons. And then either shoot himself or die in a shootout with the police, whichever came first. And so he's waiting, and he's waiting, and he's waiting, and, and, he, and, 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 and he gets bored, so he turns on the TV. And they're on the TV, his wife left it on a Christian station. There's Pastor Chuck Smith, the, the, the pastor of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And, and Pastor Chuck's saying, you know what? No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, or no matter what you're doing, God loves you and has a plan for you. Raul Reese cusses, he gets angry, he turns off the TV. 
And, and he's pacing, he's waiting, he's waiting. An hour goes by, she's still not home yet. So he turns the TV on again. Would you believe it's the exact same pastor preaching the exact same sermon in, in the exact same place saying that no matter who you are, no matter what you've done or what you're about to do, God loves you and has a plan for you. And in that moment, Raul Reese collapses. He falls to the ground. He starts bawling like a baby. And in that moment, he asks Jesus Christ to come into his heart. And it was in that moment that he got born again and gave his life to Jesus. Well, now he's, he's filled with so much joy. And, and, and so much love that, that he, he's like, you know, I gotta tell somebody, I gotta tell my wife, my wife's a Christian, I gotta tell her that, that I've become a Christian. So he, he gets in his car and he's driving all around town and he's, he's trying to trying to find her and, and, and while he's looking for her, meanwhile, she comes back from church and she opens the door and she sees all of his guns just all over the house and she's like, he's snapped, he's gonna kill us. So she locks up the door, she, 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 she barricades herself into the house and meanwhile, Raul Reese comes back. He knocks on the door, and he's like, honey, let me in. She's like, kid, kid, go away. And he's like, well, I, I, just, I just found Jesus. I just accepted Jesus. And she's like, yeah, whatever. Get lost. <laughs> I believe Philip was having one of those moments. But Philip brings him in, and, and, and he accepts him. Now, something else that stands out to me here is, is that it says that Philip, the evangelist, had four daughters who prophesied. And the reason I find that interesting is, is that, you know, you almost would have expected that, that it would have, would have said it a little bit differently. You almost would have expected that it would have said that Philip the evangelist had four daughters who were also evangelists. Four daughters who were following in their daddy's footsteps, who were like chips off the, off the old block. But that's not what it says. It says that, that Philip the evangelist had four daughters who prophesied. You see, this just reminds us that, that each of our kids are different. Each of our kids have, have their own bent, so to say. Now, by the way, I'm getting that phrase bent uh, from, from a passage in the Bible. Uh, listen to this. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. That's a very well-known passage, and, and it's a passage that, that many of us often quote whenever our kids maybe, maybe get into rebellion. Maybe they backslide. Maybe they, they go wayward. And, and so we, we hold on to a verse like this. Now, speaking of dealing with, with, with wayward, rebellious children, I love the parenting advice that Mark Twain once gave. Mark Twain said, when your kid turns 12 years old, stick him in a barrel, nail the lid shut, and feed him through the hole. When he turns 16, plug the hole. I guess that's one way to stop rebellion. But you know... A lot of us, we, we, we grab a verse like this and we hold on to it thinking that it's talking about a child and, and, and rebellion and, and that sort of thing. But you see, I think that many of us are putting the, the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable when it comes to this passage. You see, I think that the, the emphasis in, in that verse that we just read in Proverbs 22, the emphasis is, is on the words should go. But when it says train up a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Apart from what? Well, from the way that he should go. Listen to that same passage from the Amplified Bible. The Amplified Bible says, train up a child in the way that he should go, and in keeping with his individual bent or gift, when he's old, he will not, he will not depart from it. Depart from what? From his bent, from, from his gift. You see, what this is saying is, is that every child is different. Every one of our kids are, are different. It's kind of like a, like a grove of trees. In a tree grove, in a tree grove, you know, all the trees are different. All the trees are, are, are different. One tree's bent this way, and another tree's bent that way, and another one's bent this other way, and, and they've got their own bent. They're all going in, in their own direction. And so really what, what this verse is saying in Proverbs 22, it's not a promise that if, that if you raise your kids in God's word, if you raise your kids in, in God's ways, that they will never rebel. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying is this. It's saying that, that as, as parents... As parents, our job is, is to figure out how our kids are wired. Our job is, is, to, is to ask God to show us what his plan for their lives are. Our job is, is to find out what their bent is, what direction God bent their life to travel in, what, what, the, what the direction is for their life. And then once we find out what that direction is, then our job is to train them in that direction. Train them in, in the direction that, that God has. You see, the idea is, is not, as a parent, I, I'm not going to force my direction on my kids. 
I'm not going to force my kids to go in my bent, but rather I'm going to discover what their bent is, what God's direction for their life is, and train them in that direction. And evidently, that's what Philip did. Because he didn't produce many Philips, many knees. He wasn't an evangelist with four daughters who, who were walking in daddy's footsteps. He was an evangelist, but, but their bent was prophecy. And so they became prophets. Or again, female prophets, prophetesses. But now as we pick it up in verse 10, now this is where things get a little weird. Verse 10. And we stayed there many days, and a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And when he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit. So, 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 so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. And so now we meet the prophet Agabus. Now, by the way, in the original language of the Bible, the name Agabus can be translated grasshopper. So now how he got that name? Maybe he's a kid and he shoves a grasshopper and he's not doing That's what we'll call him. Grasshopper. I don't know if anybody's as old as I am. You know, you know if you are, maybe, maybe I don't know how many of you remember that, that old TV show from the 70s, Kung Fu. Anybody remember that? Some of you are like, oh, was that the one with the song? Everybody was Kung Fu fighting! No, no, that was Kung Fu Panda. But long before Kung Fu Panda, there was Kung Fu. You may remember it starred David Carradine, remember? And, and, and in the show, what was his name in the show? It was, it was Kwai Chain Kane. But what did the monks call him? Grasshopper. Oh, you very wise, Grasshopper. Well, here in, in, in Acts chapter 21, we met the original Grasshopper. The Grasshopper from the first century. And so there was, there was a prophet uh, in that area from, from Judea, and his name was, 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 was Grasshopper, Agabus. Now, by the way, the word prophet that's used here, uh, in the original, this is the Greek word prophetes. And it literally speaks of, of, of an inspired speaker. It, it's, it's someone who, who speaks on behalf of and, and interprets the, the will of a supernatural being, the will of a divine being. In other words, this was, this was like God's mouthpiece, God's spokesman. Now, by the way, we don't really know all that much about Agabus, uh, other than uh, there's an ancient tradition that tells us that, that perhaps Agabus might have been one of the 70 disciples that Jesus sent out back in Luke chapter 10. Remember that story? Jesus sends out uh, the disciples two by two to go out and preach the gospel and to, and, and, to, and to do all these different things and to cast out demons. And they come back and they're like, they're like, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Well, some believe that maybe Agabus was, was one of those guys. But we don't know that for, for, for certain. Other than that, we, we don't really know that much. Other than the fact that, that, that he did appear back in Acts chapter 11. Back in Acts chapter 11, Agabus was the one who, who showed up on the scene and, 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 he, and he prophesied that there would be a famine in, in the land during the reign of, of the Roman Emperor Claudius. Now listen, that prophecy about that famine was literally fulfilled exactly the way Agabus said it would be fulfilled in the years between A.D. 41 through A.D. 48. It was literally fulfilled. And, and, so, and so by all accounts, more than likely, Agabus was, was recognized as a true prophet. Why? He was recognized as a true prophet because what he said actually came to pass. It actually happened. And all of a sudden, Agabus, grasshopper, he shows up in a town. He grabs Paul's belt, takes Paul's belt off, and then hog ties him. I mean, ropes him up like a calf and says, that's what's going to happen to you when you come into Jerusalem. They're going to bind you. They're, they're, they're going to bind you. Hey, did I say earlier that these, these prophetic types are a little weird, a little strange? I mean, first you got Isaiah running around naked, and now this guy's wrapping people up in their own belts. And, and by the way, can I just say that, that if you feel like the Lord's given you a word for me, that's cool. Just leave my belt alone. I'm just saying that if you reach for my belt, you know, somebody's going to, we're, we're, I'm going to be laying, we're, probably somebody's getting their hands laid on, or I'm going to be laying on a hand. So, you know, just, you know, you, you got your belt, I got mine. Just, just share the word of the Lord and we'll, we'll be good. So, you know, he, he, he tells them, this is what's going to happen to you when, when you go to Jerusalem. Now, the, the, the crowd, the, the, the people, when, when, when they hear this, when, when, they, when they see what Agabus did and they, and they hear Agabus' message, they 
think that, that what that means is that Paul's not supposed to go to Jerusalem. That, that because something bad is waiting for him, they think it means that God's saying no. Because listen, we often think that if it's bad, God can't be in it. If something bad's going to happen, then, 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 then that must not be God. Because listen, quite frankly, some of us, I think we spend far too much time watching so-called Christian television or, or, or reading books out there like, like Joel Osteen's Your Best Life Now and not enough time reading this. Not enough time reading the, the Bible. Because listen, when, when, when you read the Bible, I mean, there's some things that happen to some people in here and they were not good things. I mean, you think of, 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 of Daniel thrown into the lion's den. Not good. Not good at all. You think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the fiery furnace. That's not good. Or you think of, uh, of the Apostle Paul, all those times that he was beaten and, and arrested and thrown into prison. Or you think of Jesus crucified or John the Baptist beheaded. I dare you to tell John the Baptist that that was his best life now. I think that's going to happen to you. Just don't lose your head. And so, so many of us, we, we bought into this, this easy believism, this, this whole idea of, of, of that, if, that, if, that if it's God's will, then it's going to be easy. If it's God's will, it's going to be easy streets and smooth sailing. And so then we tend to think that, that if something bad happens, we must not be in God's will. We must be out of God's will. But listen to me, I'm here to tell you that sometimes being in the will of God is hard. It's not always easy streets. Now, you'll have the Lord with you. He said he'll never leave you or forsake you. You'll have his presence, and, and, and he, won't, he won't abandon you. But it's not always going to be easy. And so Agabus is telling him, look, this is what's going to happen to you when you go to Jerusalem. Now, if you notice, Agabus never said, don't go to Jerusalem. Agabus just said, this is what's going to happen to you when you get there. It was the crowd. It was, it was even Paul's companions joined in on it. It was the crowd who interpreted it and said, well, that must mean that you're not supposed to go. So what do we do with this? What, 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 how do we handle this? I mean, when, when somebody has a word for you, how do we handle the, the quote-unquote stranger things of prophecy? Well, let's talk about that as we look at these last two verses, verses 13 and 14. Then Paul answered and said, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to, to, to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we ceased, saying, the will of the Lord be done. So again, <clears throat> Agabus was a prophet, right? He, he, was, he, was, he was a spokesman for God, God's mouthpiece. And so you would have thought that, that Paul would have, would have treated the words that were coming out of Agabus's mouth as if they were the word of God himself, as if God himself had spoken. But instead, that's not exactly what Paul does. Paul says, you know what, why, why, are you, why are you trying to make me weep and break my heart? I'm, ready to be, I'm not only ready to be bound, but, but to die in Jerusalem. In effect, Paul was saying, I don't receive that as the word of the Lord. I do receive that, that yeah, there's, there's trouble waiting for me. Yeah, it, 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 he said, the Holy Spirit told me in, in Acts chapter 20, verses 22 through 23, that when I get to Jerusalem, chains and afflictions are waiting for me. And so I receive that. But, but listen, I go there bound in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit's been telling me to go to Jerusalem. I'm supposed to go there. And so, and so I, I don't receive this. Leaving us to wonder, is, is, is that okay? I mean, is it, is it really okay for us to, to, to do that with a quote-unquote word from the Lord? When somebody gives you a word from the Lord, can, can you actually turn to them and say, yeah, no. I, I don't, I, no, I don't think that was a word from the Lord. Again, I, I mentioned this at the beginning, but, but have you ever been in a situation where somebody comes up and they're like, you know what? I, the, the Lord spoke to me. I have a word for you. You know, God told me to tell you this and this, or that and, and this, and, and you know, God, God told me to tell you such and such. You know, and, and maybe He did, and maybe He didn't. You know, maybe it was God, but then again, you know, maybe it was just bad pizza. Or here in Brighton, maybe it was some, some bad Santiago's. Or then again, maybe they were just off their meds. They missed their lithium. Or for that matter, maybe they're just manipulating them. Because let's face it, we know that in some, and in, in certain Christian circles, that, 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 a, that a surefire way to get what you want is to just say, God told me. 
and then act all offended when somebody questions that and questions you, and you're like, and you're all like, well, if you're questioning me, you're questioning God. And you have to say it just like that. God. <laughs> and so what do we do? I mean, I mean, how do we handle this? Well, I want to, I want to share with you two biblical principles when it comes to prophecy. Two biblical principles when it comes to dealing with the stranger things of pro prophecy. Ready? Principle number one. Principle number one is simply that the God is not using the gift of prophecy the same way that he used it in the Old Testament. Now listen to me clearly. I did not say God's not using the gift of prophecy. I believe in the gift of prophecy, and I believe God still uses the gift of prophecy. It is, it, it is alive and active and very much a part of what God does. What I'm saying is, is that God is not using prophets that today the same way he used prophets in the Old Testament. Listen, we know that in the Old Testament, God would speak through the prophets, and they literally were God's mouthpiece. He would speak, and it was the literal word of God. And so if you were rejecting what they said, you were rejecting the, 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 the God himself. Like we know that these prophets, like, like, like Isaiah and, and Jeremiah and, 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 and Amos and all these other prophets, that oftentimes what they spoke actually became scripture, the, the, the word of God. But listen, that's not how God's using that gift today. That's not how God's using prophets today. And we know that because the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, it says that in the past, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed as heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. And so it says that in, in times past, in various ways, yeah, he spoke through prophets. He spoke through, through, through Moses and everything that Moses said. I mean, that, you know, that, 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 that's how we got the first five books of the Bible. And he spoke through Isaiah. He spoke through these prophets. It was the word of God. But now in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son, he says. Now, by the way, that, that word spoken, when it says that he has spoken to us in these last days by his son, in the original language, and this is going to change your life. Get ready for it. In the original language, this is in a, in a Greek tense known, known as the Eros Active Imperative. Didn't that just change everything for you? No. No, but, but what, what it means is, is that it's, it, it's, it's literally saying that he has spoken once and for all. Once and for all. It, it, it's his final word. Yeah, in times past, he spoke in various ways and in, in various means, and, and he spoke through the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken once and for all through Jesus. It's his final word. That's why Jesus is called, in, John, in John's gospel, the word. He's spoken, he's, he's the revelation of God to us. In other words, what we're saying, you could think of it this way. The gift of prophecy is, is, is still in use. The gift of prophecy is still in operation today. But the office of the prophet is closed. The gift is still in operation, but the office of the prophet is, is, is closed. In other words, there are no prophets today that are still writing scripture. It's complete. It's done. It's the final word of God. And so number one, when it comes to dealing with this, you need to understand that, that, that God's not using prophets today the same way that he did back in the Old Testament. So when somebody's getting heavy-handed with you, somebody's getting authoritative, authoritative with you, and they're all like, well, you have to listen to me because this is the word of God, you need to understand that, that God's using things differently. He's spoken to us through his final word, and that's Jesus. That's principle number one. Principle number two, when somebody comes to you with, with, with the word from the Lord, the scripture tells us, to test it. To test it. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. Why? Well, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So because there's a such thing as false prophets, you're supposed to test the prophets. You're supposed to test the spirits, test it. Likewise, the Apostle Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, he says, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, test all things and hold fast to what is good. And so we're to test all things, we're, we're to test it. But listen, at the same time, Paul said, don't quench the Holy Spirit and do not despise prophecies. 
Don't, because you're afraid of it, don't sit there and despise it and say, well, it's, it, it's all bad. And, and no, listen, God still speaks. He speaks to his people. And sometimes he speaks through his people. So you don't despise it, you test it. You test it to see whether it's of God or not. Why? Why do we test it? Well, because, frankly, not everyone who claims to be a prophet really is. Not everyone who claims that they're speaking for God really is speaking for God. In fact, there's a very interesting story in the Bible in 1 Kings chapter 13. In 1 Kings chapter 13, we meet this prophet who goes and rebukes King Jeroboam. Because King Jeroboam was leading the land in idol worship. So the prophet goes and rebukes him publicly. Well, now Jeroboam, he's, he's offended and he's hurt and he wants to get even. And, and so he, he wants to trap the prophet. And so he does it by, by inviting the prophet over for dinner. But God speaks to the prophet. And God warns the prophet. And God tells the prophet not to go to, uh, and, and have, have dinner and, and break bread with the king. In fact, he says, you know, don't, don't eat with anybody in that city because that whole city has, has given themselves over to idol worship. God says, you know what? Trust no one. So he rejects the king's offer, but as he's leaving town, all of a sudden this, 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 this other guy comes up and, and invites the prophet to come over to his house and, and break bread and, and, and have dinner. And at first, the, the prophet answers and says the same thing. He says, no, I, I can't do it because God's told me not, 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 to, not to break bread, not to eat with anybody in the city because practically everybody in the city has fallen into idol worship. God told me to trust no one. But then, here's what happens. In, in, in 1 Kings chapter 13, verse 18, the guy that he was talking to, it says, He said to him, I too am a prophet, just as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with you to your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. But then notice in parentheses, but he was lying to him. He was lying. He, he wasn't a real prophet. He was a false prophet. But the, but the true prophet, he, he, he believed it. He bought it hook, line, and sinker. He's like, well, okay. If God told you. <laughs> and he goes over to his house, and, he, and, he, and he's eating, and, and, he, and he's having a meal. But then all of a sudden, God intervenes, and, and God actually uses the false prophet. And it opens the false prophet's mouth to speak the real word of the Lord to the true prophet. And so all of a sudden they're having dinner. The false prophet opens his mouth, and here's what the word says to the, to, the, to the real prophet. He says, because you listened to this guy rather than listen to my voice, because you obeyed his word rather than obeying my word, I mean, I told you not to eat with anybody here. I told you not to trust anybody here. But because you trusted him, and because you obeyed him rather than obeying me, you're going to die. And he did. Listening to the wrong voice can be deadly. If not physically, definitely spiritually. And so you need to test. But, but how? How do we test the prophecies? How do we test? Well, test number one is that it needs to be 100% accurate. Not 99.99999. No, 100% accurate 100% of the time. We find this in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 21 through 22. Deuteronomy 18, 21-22 tells us that, that, that if it's true prophecy, truly from the Lord, it's going to be 100% accurate, 100% of the time. And if it's not 100% accurate, it's false prophecy. But here's the catch. Deuteronomy 18 also says that if they are a false prophet, you are to take them and stone them. That doesn't mean take them to a pot shop in Colorado. That means with rocks. I'm going to clear that up. Now, listen. We, 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 we're in the New Testament times. That was the Old Testament. Today, you do not need to go out and find false prophets and then kill them. But you do need to stop listening to them. You do need to stop giving them a platform in your life. And so you test it. Number one, 100% accuracy. But number two, test number two. Does what they say line up with the scriptures? Is what they're saying line up with this? Because listen, we know this is the word of the Lord. This is God's word. And check it out. He's not going to contradict himself. I mean, if what they're saying doesn't line up with this, this is true. They are false. And so you've got to test it. You've got to test it. Because listen to me. Practically every single cult and false religion out there uses this book or at least parts of it. 
They, they have enough of this in there. They have enough truth in them to deceive you. That's the whole goal is to deceive you. Jesus said in the last days uh, that, that, that they would come to try to deceive, if, if possible, even the elect. And so they want to they want to say, yeah, we're Christians, as they got their little ties on and their bikes and they go door to door. Oh yeah, no, we're, we're Christians just like you. And, 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 they, and they quote these books, and they, you know, and, 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 and you know, and we're looking at them. Well, you know, they're not that bad. I mean, yeah, they're a little off, but you know, I mean, I mean, it's okay. I mean, you know, they, they've got great family values. You know, they got great music over there. Or you know what? They 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 quote the Bible. I mean, yeah, they might not quote the whole Bible, you know, but 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 they do quote some of the Bible. They don't believe in the Old Testament, but they you know, but they they talk about the Bible. So yeah, they're they're a little off. You know, they're, they're, you know, just, just they're like one degree off. But what, what's the big deal? I mean, what's the big deal about being one little degree off? Let me illustrate for you the big deal of being one little degree off. October 31st, 1983. Korean Airlines flight 007 is leaving Anchorage, Alaska for, for, for Seoul, South Korea. Now, unknown to, to the flight crew, there was a one degree routing error in the computer system. Now, take off that, 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 that little uh, routing error was, was virtually undetectable. Nobody even noticed. In fact, 100 miles into the flight, uh, that, that, that defect was still virtually unnoticed. But as they flew, as that, as that giant 747 flew across the Pacific, it ended up not over Korea. It ended up over the Soviet Union. And when the Soviets picked it up on their, on their radar, they thought they were being attacked. They scrambled their fighter jets, and they blew that jet out of the sky, killing everyone on board. There were no survivors. Listen, that's being one degree off. Just one degree off. This is why it's so important that you, above all things, know this book. And you test all things. You, you, you take this book and you test what I'm saying. It just as the Apostle Paul said, you know you need to be a Berean. Go to this book, go to the scriptures to see what I'm saying. So you test all things. Trust no one. Not even if they're just one degree off. And so Paul, he, 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 yeah, the word of the Lord was telling him to go to Jerusalem. But when he got to Jerusalem, there was going to be pain. There was going to be tribulation. And so he believed that. That was the word of the Lord. But that didn't mean that he wasn't supposed to go. So he rejected that part of it. So Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that, that you are a God who speaks to his children. Lord, you, you, there are times in our lives where we feel like, like we're not hearing from you. And maybe it's because we're looking for something mystical. We, we want like, some kind of weeby cheeby thing or something emotional. Or we want a mouthpiece, a human being that will tell us. But Lord, some of us, we have so much dust on our Bibles it's no wonder we're not hearing from you. So Lord, we, we pray that, that as we open this book, you would give us ears to hear what your spirit would say to your church.